What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel and if you're new here just welcome. My name is Gemma Jade but today we are going to be discussing the case of Martha Needle. Martha Needle was born on April 9th 1864 in a town called Morgan in South Australia. Another tourist. Morgan, as I said, is a very small town in South Australia that sits on the banks of the Murray River. Her father's name was Joseph Henry Childs and her mother's name was Mary. However, Martha never knew her biological father. She never knew Joseph because while her mother was still pregnant for her, Joseph took off and left the family. While Martha was still very young, I'm not sure exactly what age, her mother Mary left Morgan and moved to Adelaide, which was the capital of Australia. And she met, fell in love with, and remarried a very violent and aggressive man named Daniel Thorin. Daniel was originally from Ireland and came to Adelaide as part of the British Army. He was part of the 2nd Somersetshire Regi Regiment. However, he deserted three times, and each time he deserted, he had to have the letter D tattooed on the bottom of his arm. So it would be right here, which is a weird place to put it because it's very easily covered up. And I guess the D stood for deserter. So that's the kind of man we're looking at here. A violent and aggressive Irishman who deserted the army three times. At least. Martha had a pretty rough upbringing. Not knowing her biological father really bothered her. She probably idolized him because what she actually had as a father figure was her stepfather, this Daniel Thorin, who would get drunk and Mary was also an alcoholic, Martha's mother. So they would both get drunk and they would argue, they would fist fight, they would throw things around the house. And sometimes the aggression would even be taken out on Martha. I didn't find specifically if she was beaten, but I know there was a lot of verbal and emotional, mental abuse, and a lot of neglect, which can be really hard, obviously, and can really affect somebody at those very tender years going through all of that. In 1876, Daniel Thorne was sent to prison for two years, but I couldn't find what for. So at least that got him out of the house. When she was 12 years old, Martha's mother made her start work as a domestic servant. This wasn't very uncommon back then. If you guys watched the Mary Bateman video, if you didn't, I'll put it right here. And after you watch this one, you should go check that one out. It's another old timey criminal um, case that I did. So women were sent into domestic servitude um, from as young as the age of 10, maybe younger, but 12, 13 was the average age that a girl, a young woman, would be sent to be a domestic servant. And that's exactly what Mary sent Martha to do. She probably needed help financially. Martha Needle was an extremely hard worker from the minute she started. Martha took her job very seriously. She she was wonderful. She was described as very sweet and uh, very serious for her age. She She really took her responsibilities when she worked in these homes very seriously. So Martha stayed in Adelaide working as a domestic servant. Um, she did this for five years and the only reason she stopped was because in 1881 she met and married a carpenter named Henry Needle. Henry was four years older than Martha and he was from Whedon, Northamptonshire, England. And once married, the couple decided to move to Sydney because back then Sydney was like the place to be. It was considered um, very forward for the day, um, for lack of a better term. While in Sydney, Henry was able to find a really well-paying carpentering job. It was a little bit because of his great skill in his desired trade. He was a really wonderful and talented carpenter. But mainly it was due to the economic boom that was happening in the country, mainly in Sydney at the time. So Martha and Henry, with him having this job, ended up being, I don't want to say super well off, but they were definitely considered wealthy for the time. In 1882, Martha gave birth to the couple's first child and they named her Mabel. And in 1884, the couple had another daughter whom they named Elsie. In the beginning of 1885, the family moved to Melbourne, Australia, which because of the recent success of the gold rush, this was one of the wealthiest cities in the entire world. And they thought they would do really well here. 
they really settled into a very nice, a very comfortable life. Martha didn't want for anything. They didn't need anything. Um, Henry was really able to provide at this time for them. And due to Henry's well-paying job, the couple were able to find a really nice kind of fancy house in the more affluent and upper class suburb of Richmond. Although she had come a very long way from her troubled and rough upbringing with her mother and stepfather, sometimes trouble and pain just can't be avoided no matter how good you have it as Martha and her family would soon find out. Martha and Henry's eldest daughter Mabel became sick and after a very brief illness she actually passed away. The official cause of death was respiratory and cardiac bronchitis. Although Henry and friends and neighbors of, of Martha and the couple tried their best to do everything they could to comfort her, Martha could not be consoled. She fell into a deep depression over the death of her daughter Mabel and she grieved and mourned for her daughter day in and day out for a really long time. Back in those days, people who were wealthy as the needles were considered to be, it was common for them to take out life insurance policies on every member of the family. And the needles did get 100 pounds of life insurance for the death of Mabel, but it seemed to not affect Martha one way or the other. She was so overcome with her grief that it seemed to everyone around her, she didn't even notice that they came into this great windfall. The reason people kind of noticed this not having an effect on her is because 100 pounds in 1885 was equivalent to about 12,934 pounds and 58 cents. Do you guys have cents? I'm sorry. So it was equal to almost 13,000 pounds today. But Martha didn't seem to care. She just wanted her daughter back. Mabel's death had an extremely negative effect on Martha and Henry's marriage, unfortunately, and it could have also been due to the fact that Henry had lost his job somehow. I don't know how I did look and he was having trouble finding a carpentering job that was paying him enough to keep up with this affluent and comfortable lifestyle that the family had become accustomed to. So the only place that he could find a job that would help him to make enough money to keep up with this lifestyle was in Sydney. But Martha didn't want to move there with little Elsie because she was happy in the neighborhood she was in. They loved the suburb of Richmond. They had this beautiful house. So Henry went to live in Sydney and work there and send the money back to Martha. So Martha and Elsie were able to remain in their home in Richmond and not have to disrupt their lives too much. I mean, that's probably a really bad idea when you lose a child and your marriage is struggling anyway to split up, but that's just my opinion. So after Henry did this, after he left to go to Sydney to work, Martha started going out a lot to the local bars and taverns and pubs, and she became quite a popular and most sought after woman. She was a woman about town. From the first night Henry moved out of the house, Martha went out drinking every single night, just bar hopping from pub to pub, from tavern to tavern, drinking, doing whatever, having a grand old time. Henry did occasionally come back to visit Martha and Elsie, but for the most part, he just sent money home to take care of them financially. However, he must have been coming back enough because in 1886, Martha gave birth to the, to the couple's third child, another daughter, whom they named May. Henry decided with the birth of May that he needed to move back to Richmond to be with his family. He didn't want to be separated from Martha anymore. He wanted them to get their marriage back on track. He wanted to be a family again. However, this seemed to have a less than desired, the complete opposite effect of what he was hoping. Um this effect it had on their marriage. He thought it would bring them closer and they can get back to where they were before Mabel died, but it just didn't happen. Martha seemed to have at least emotionally checked out. Henry ended up becoming really sullen and withdrawn because Martha didn't for one second, like she didn't skip a beat. She wasn't giving up her hard partying lifestyle. And Henry worked all day during the day at a carpentering job to support his family when he moved back to Richmond. 
and we know he wasn't making the same amount to keep up with their lifestyle, but this didn't matter to Martha. The minute he came through the door, Martha was out the door to keep up with, keep up appearances. She was back to pub hopping. So Henry would work all day. And then the minute he walked through the door, he would be taking care of toddler Elsie and infant May while Martha ran out getting drunk, partying with her friends and neighbors and possibly other men at these pubs and taverns. In 1889, Henry became very, very sick. Martha called Dr. George Hodgson, who was the same doctor who had tended to Mabel during her illness and eventual passing away. The doctor was really concerned about this because Henry was said to be very physically fit, very active, very health conscious, even for that day, kind of a man. And all of a sudden, like seemingly overnight, he was very sick, very weak. Martha did her very best to care for her sick husband. She stopped going out. She stopped partying. She was staying home with the kids. She was waiting on him, you know, hand and foot, day and night. But for some reason, and he never gave a specific reason for this, Henry refused to eat anything Martha prepared for him. Everyone thought it was strange, but he, ne like I said, he never said why. He just would not eat anything she prepared. Neighbors and friends had to come over and, and bring food. Over the next few months, this went on and on with Martha trying to care for Henry, Henry refusing to eat the food, Dr. Hodgson coming in and out trying different things. He was really stumped as to what was going on with Henry. And eventually, just a few months after he got sick, it, on October 4th in 1889, Henry passed away as well. Dr. Hodgson listed the official cause of death as subacute hepatitis. And I wrote here, I think that's something like inflammation of the liver. I tried looking it up, but obviously I'm not a doctor and I could not understand the terminology used in the explanations of what I found on multiple sources. It was like not in lay terms. So subacute hepatitis, um, something to do with liver inflammation is how he passed away, though it seemed to Dr. Hodgson. And that was the official cause of death. Everyone who knew the Needles, who knew Martha and Henry and their family, like their neighbors, their friends, even Dr. Hodgson, were struck at how well and dutifully Martha had cared for Henry in his final days from the very beginning of, their, of his illness. So because of this, because they saw how she was toward her, towards her husband in the end there and how torn up she was about his death, they really rallied. They prepared meals for her. They helped watch the children. They kind of closed in on her with love and friendship um, the best that they could to get her through this grieving process. Again, a life insurance policy had been, which was normal, taken out on Henry and Martha ended up with 60 pounds out of the hundred. The other 40 pounds immediately went into an investment for the remaining children, the surviving children, Elsie and May. Again, that's a lot of money. 60 pounds in 1889 is equivalent to almost 8,000 pounds, 7,700 and something pounds. So a tremendous amount of money. But again, Martha seemed to be unaffected by it. She was busy grieving her husband, too busy grieving her husband to worry about money. However, no matter how much love and attention and care she got from friends and neighbors and even her doctor, Martha seemed to be completely unable to escape tragedy for any significant length of time because just a little over a year after her husband Henry had passed away, Martha's eldest daughter now, Elsie, also suddenly became ill. On December 9th, 1890, Elsie passed away. Dr. Hodgson, the family doctor, was once again called to give the official death report, but he could not officially say what exactly had caused young Elsie to die, except to say that the conditions were very, very similar to, but not exactly the same as what had killed young Mabel. Martha again received 60 pounds that was taken out um, as life insurance on the young girl. Less than a year after the death of Elsie, the Needles' only surviving and youngest child, May, suddenly became very ill. Martha dutifully did everything she could, took care of, loved, catered to her youngest daughter as best she could, just had, as she had seemed to do for her husband and previous two children who had passed away. She was there day and night at her daughter's side, no partying, 
just grieving, mourning the loss of her other two daughters and her husband still while trying to seemingly keep May alive. Again, Dr. Hodgson was in and out of the home constantly trying to help in any way he could, trying to figure out what was wrong with May because he really was trying his best not to have Martha have another tragedy in her life, not to have another child or loved one or family member pass away. But unfortunately, he just could not figure out what was ailing young May. Despite everyone, including Martha's best efforts, in August of 1891, May passed away and Dr. Hodgson's listed her death as tubercular meningitis. So I looked that up and it is inflammation of membranes around the brain or spinal cord. And that's just to put it really simply. That's the simplest explanation I found of tubercular meningitis. Martha again received 60 pounds. I don't know where the other 40 pounds went because there are no surviving children. I don't know if she received the other 80 pounds. I, I just don't know. But I know she received 60 pounds, another 60 pounds from life insurance from the death of May. In just six short years, Martha Needle had lost her entire family to illness. All three of her daughters, Mabel, Elsie, and May, and her dear husband, Henry. Just six years, she lost her entire family. In 1892, Martha was offered a job as a domestic servant for two brothers who lived right there in Richmond, just a mile or two away from Martha Needle's home. She was kind of lonely, kind of floundering, getting sick of running out every single night. I mean, she had some money, but um, she did have a lifestyle to upkeep with her home and her fashion and all that kind of stuff. So she was actually very grateful for the offer and happily accepted it. The brothers' names were Otto and Louis Junkin, and Martha moved in with them right away. It seems their father had just recently passed away and left them a large sum of money that they used to start a business making and repairing equipment for horses. The Junkin brothers ran this business directly from their home. The brothers were new to the area. They had just moved there from a place called Lindock, South Australia, and I'll spell it up on the screen. Otto and Louie had another brother named Herman and a mother living in Adelaide. Martha stayed in the adjoining house to the Junkin brothers' house, so she was right on their property. That way she can kind of be at their beck and call and also do her job better because she would always be there for them. Um, they were two single unmarried men, so they kind of needed a woman around, you know, as everyone thought back in those days, to do the wash and cook the meals and clean and blah, 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 right? Um, and this was Martha, and she really enjoyed it. She obviously sold her house, and she collected the money from that, so she was quite a little saver, Martha. Not very long at all after moving in to the adjoining property to the Junkin Brothers and um, starting her domestic servitude to them, Martha and the brother Otto became engaged. They didn't just start dating. They actually became engaged like within months of meeting each other of Martha starting to work for them. Brother Louie was not happy about this at all. And some of the reasons were he said Martha had an extremely violent temper and she was prone to these mood swings that would seemingly come out of nowhere where she would just become really aggressive and violent out of nowhere or she would become extremely sad um, and despondent all of a sudden. So he thought she was really unstable, especially um, emotionally unstable. So it wasn't so much her as like a person that like he didn't think she was good enough for Otto, but he just thought she was very strange. She exhibited very strange behaviors and he really didn't want his brother getting involved in that. So he was very vocal about not supporting this engagement. Louis described Martha as irrational and he said sometimes she would go out even in the middle of the night walking around and when asked what she was doing, she would state that she was going to find her lost children. Obviously, this made no sense to anyone around her because everyone, including Martha, knew that her three daughters had passed away. But she insisted they were out there somewhere and she was going to find them. Otto and Louie's mother also expressed her disapproval to Otto about the engagement to Martha for probably the exact same reasons that Louis disapproved. And Louis and their mother tried to put a lot of pressure on Otto to break off the engagement. But no matter how much pressure they tried to put on him, he could not be swayed. 
He was in love with Martha. She must have had some kind of hold on him. I don't know because he absolutely refused to break off the engagement. Despite all the tension in the air that must have been in this home, things went on as usual with the brothers working on building up their business and making money and Martha actually staying in her position of domestic servant to the brothers, even though she was married, um, going to be marrying one of them. Though things went on business as usual, Louis never stopped pointing out Martha's erratic behavior, her violent temper tantrums to his brother Otto, trying to change his mind about marrying Martha. And Louis suddenly became ill in August of 1893. For 10 days, Louis had extreme stomach cramps, uncontrollable vomiting, diarrhea. He was severely sick, but luckily a, a friend, a relative, I think it was a cousin, who lived in the area came to visit and nurse him back to health as Martha was busy with other things in the home. Um, after a few days of this relative, I think it was a cousin being there to help nurse Louis back to health. He actually did start to feel better. He stopped exhibiting any symptoms and he finally started to accept the fact that Martha was in fact going to be his sister-in-law and he stopped pointing out her flaws and started being more friendly to her. And miraculously, as soon as he did this, he stopped getting sick and felt 100% better. Hmm. Louis, though, and everyone around him seemed to attribute his ill health and miraculous recovery to the stress of worrying about his brother marrying Martha. And he just couldn't do it anymore. That's kind of why he accepted it. He thought all the stress and the tension and the negative energy in the home um, was causing his illness. So... He just stopped worrying about it. He accepted it and was like, it's your life, bro, whatever. Um, however, in April of 1894, Louis became really sick again. This illness was almost the same as the last time with the severe vomiting, the stomach cramps, the diarrhea. However, it was a little different because it was accompanied by a sore mouth, sore gums, and sore tongue. Once again, a relative that lived close by came to help care for Louis and to tend to him, to kind of nurse him back to health. And it seemed to work. And this time the relative stayed for about a month just to be sure that the symptoms were actually gone because the other relative, the cousin had left so quickly last time they thought maybe, yeah, I don't know. She stayed for a month. She left when he was feeling a hundred percent better and stopped exhibiting any sign of any kind of illness. Within a week of this relative leaving though, Louis seemed to regress right back into the sickness. And I guess no relative was able to get to him because this left Martha caring for him. Again, though, just as with her children and husband, everyone was so in awe of how attentive and loving and nurturing and caring Martha was toward Louis, even though he had expressed so much distaste and disdain for her. She tried really hard, um, or so it looked to everyone, to really take care of him and do her best to get him to feel better. However, just about a week or so after being left in Martha's care, Louis Junkin died in his home and the doctor stated the cause of death as exhaustion and inflammation of the stomach and heart membranes. Upon his death, Louis and Otto's brother and their mother came to Richmond to stay in the home so that they can settle Louis's estate. They were also there to try and change Otto's mind about marrying Martha. They just did not like her. They did not trust her and they did not want her being a part of the family. Can you imagine how uncomfortable that would be? Like you're living in a house with your fiance and his family comes like just to tell you that or to tell him that they can't stand you and don't want you to be part of the family. Like that, that's got to really hurt. That's got to suck. However, just as he had done all the times before, Otto stood firm that he was not leaving Martha and they were to be married. However, Martha, this visit by... Um, Otto's brother Herman and his mother really caused Martha a lot of stress and fear and anxiety because she felt like yeah he stood firm in the past but the with the emotions being so raw from his brother's death and his own mother telling him that she did not approve of Martha Martha was really scared that she was going to lose Otto this time she really thought his family this time was going to succeed in getting him to call off the wedding so with the arrival of their mother, whose name was Margaret, and their brother Herman, Martha became even more temperamental, even more kind of emotionally and mentally unstable, which probably worked 
really not in her benefit as that's the main reason they didn't want her marrying their son in the first place. And it seemed to get way worse while they were there because she was so stressed out and anxious. Every single time she saw one of them speaking to Otto out of her hearing range, she was convinced they were bad-mouthing her and trying to get him to call off the wedding. Ha Despite all this, though, Martha did her very best to prove herself a good hostess, a good woman, a good addition to their family, um, someone that Otto should be with. She cooked, she cleaned, she prepared and served all the meals. She waited on Margaret and Herman and Otto hand and foot the entire time they were there. It didn't work, though, because it, just a few days after being there, Herman started becoming really, really sick with the same symptoms Louis had passed away from. But it's like he would get sick, and then, like, two days later, he'd be 100% better. Then he'd get sick a day later, and then two days later, he'd be 100% better. This kept going back and forth of this guy getting sick and suddenly feeling better with Martha's help. Every time he'd get sick, Martha would be right there nursing him back to health. However, eventually, after about a week or two of going back and forth, Herman became severely ill and did not start feeling better a few days later. Same symptoms, violent vomiting, severe diarrhea, um, unpainful, un painful, unbearable stomach cramps, the whole nine that Louis had had and that Henry before him had had. With Herman becoming so incredibly ill all of a sudden and, and going back and forth, um, his mother, Margaret, was obviously very concerned and she called a doctor to the house to check on and see what was wrong with and possibly help cure her son, Herman. She did not call Dr. Hodgson though. She called their family doctor, the Junkins family doctor, whose name was Dr. Boyd. Dr. Boyd almost immediately had a suspicion that Herman had been being poisoned. He kept his suspicions to himself, but while he did so, he collected a sample of Herman's vomit and sent it off to a government laboratory for analysis. Lo and behold, just a week or so later, when he got the results from the sample back, his suspicions were confirmed and there were extremely high levels of arsenic in his vomit. So in his body, in his system, and he had been poisoned somehow. When Dr. Boyd told this news to Herman, Herman was afraid to tell Otto because he knew that Otto was so in love and so smitten with Martha that he probably wasn't going to believe him, even though reasonably um, Herman, Dr. Boyd had deduced that it had to have been Martha because she was the only one preparing and serving meals. Margaret hadn't cooked anything. The men hadn't cooked anything and they hadn't gone out anywhere, ordered anything in. It was all Martha. So Herman and Dr. Boyd knew it was Martha, but they were afraid to tell Otto. So they didn't. And Herman told no one. He didn't tell Otto. He didn't tell Margaret. He didn't tell Martha. He told the doctor to keep his suspicions to himself as he himself had done. And he instead went to the police. Herman and the police devised a plan to catch Martha in the act, a plan that Otto would not be able to deny. They needed to catch her red-handed serving up poison to Herman. After his visit to the police station, Herman returned to the house and told everyone how wonderful he felt. And he even went out of his way to be nice to Martha. He sang her praises for her cooking and cleaning. He told her how much he adored her for having taken care of him and, and nursed him through his sickness. He went all out really complimenting her and telling her welcome to the family. And he accepted her now and all this stuff that Martha had seemingly been waiting to hear for all these months. So he really laid it on thick. He then asked Martha to make him a cup of tea. Martha cheerfully agreed. She couldn't believe her good luck that Herman was finally coming around to her being his sister-in-law and she wouldn't have to live in stress and fear and anxiety anymore of someone taking her fiance away. So she made him the cup of tea. As soon as Martha set the tea down on the table in front of Herman, he blew a whistle and this was a signal for the police to come in. Martha knew what was going on immediately and tried to knock the tea onto the floor. You see, back in those days, you can buy arsenic very easily, either through rat poison or it was also used in floor cleaner. So had she knocked it on the floor, she could have said that it came from the floor polish, that she had just gotten done doing the floors. She would have had some kind of defense and to be able to say that it wasn't in the tea, it was in, on the floor. However, she was unsuccessful in her attempts and the tea was taken by the police who sent out to see if it contained arsenic. 
Of course, when the results of the test came back, there were very high levels of arsenic in the tea that Martha was trying to get Herman to drink. The police immediately arrested her and charged her with attempted murder. And this is where the official investigation into Martha Needle began. So something I want to say before I get into the next part is I looked up arsenic and something interesting I found is two grains are enough to kill a human being. And the cup of tea Martha was giving to Herman contained 10 grains. The police started their investigation by immediately exhuming Louis's body and Louis's body contained almost four grains. So Louis's body contained twice the amount needed to kill a human being. And the tea that she was about to give Herman contained five times the amount of arsenic needed to kill a human being. So she wasn't playing around when it came to Herman. I guess she was tired of him getting sick and feeling better all of the time. It's like, won't you just die? That's probably what she was thinking, not me. The authorities also exhumed the bodies of all four of Martha's family members, her husband, Henry, and her daughters, Mabel, Elsie, and May. All four of them had traces of arsenic in their system. I don't know if with decomposition, arsenic kind of leaves the body. This wasn't very long after they had died because they had all died in such, such quick succession. So she was convicted of murdering all four of them as well. Plus Louis, that's five murders and the attempted murder of Herman. Very quickly, as was common back in those days, the press, the media got a hold of the story and they dubbed Martha, quote, the Richmond Poisoner, end quote. Again, very original. Martha Needle's trial started in September of 1894 and she never wavered in her claim of innocence. She denied the whole thing. She said that she was innocent, that, you know, she never killed anybody. However, by that time, with all the exhumations, all of the evidence piling up that the prosecution had against her, the press and the court did not show her any sympathy. And that courtroom was packed. This was a huge trial. They were, they did not like her and they did not believe her for one second. The prosecution started by presenting evidence that on May 10th, 1894, Martha purchased a certain kind of arsenic called rough on rats. Like I said, it was arsenic was available on, in rat poison in those days. Just five days after Martha purchased this specific kind of rat poisoning with a ton of arsenic in it, Louis Junkin died of his mysterious illness. The defense countered that Martha suffered from bouts of blackouts. So again, are we trying for the insanity defense here? I think so. The defense stated Martha suffered from, quote, unconsciousness and not being aware of what she was doing, end quote. They were able to prove this to the jury by bringing in many witnesses who had seen Martha's, you know, violent tantrums, her sudden mood swings, and most of them who saw her walking around all hours of the day and night telling people she was looking for her children, seemingly unaware that they were deceased, even though everyone knew that she knew that her children were deceased. So they brought in witness after witness to testify in her defense, or at least in defense of this defense, does that make any sense? That she was in fact kind of kooky. So the defense stated that she wasn't of sound mind and shouldn't be held accountable for her actions. So the regular insanity defense, lack of criminal responsibility due to diminished mental capacity. Otto even took the stand in Martha's defense. Despite ha her having been caught that she had murdered his one brother and tried desperately multiple numerous times to murder his other. He still loved her. He stood by her side and he testified that she was prone to quote fits of faints end quote. He stated that she would regularly for no reason at all fall on the ground pass out and then not be able to get up. Trying to sway the court and the jury and the judge even further the defense brought up Martha's poor upbringing. They said how she was subject to the emotional, mental, and possible physical, maybe sexual abuse of her stepfather and her mother, who were both alcoholics. They said the only way that she could escape her home life was in a runaway marriage to the first man that paid any attention to her, that she didn't even want to marry. She just wanted to get out of her house as a young woman. They brought all this up, the childhood defense, the insanity defense, the my mommy didn't hug me enough defense. Just calling it as I see it, guys. 
Witnesses testified that she was known to be extremely impulsive, and they even had one or two people testify that it was a known fact, according to them, that Martha heard voices in her head telling her to do things. The defense even had witnesses come forward and state how doting and caring and loving of a wife and mother Martha was, especially in and during the illnesses of her husband and children. Even Louie, who didn't like her, Martha seemed to really, really try and care for. Herman as well. People saw this with their own eyes, that she seemed very genuinely concerned and wanting to help her family members and these other loved ones not be sick anymore. I mean, that's a big difference from the murderous and evil woman, temptress, that the prosecution was trying to paint her as. However, the judge completely rejected Martha's insanity plea. He was totally unmoved by it. He didn't believe a word of it. He thought she was cold and calculating and knew exactly what she was doing even in the moments when it seemed like she was a loving and doting wife and didn't care about the money, she was just very, very good at what she did. As to why he rejected her insanity defense, the judge stated, quote, the law cannot wait while philosophers, physicians, and scientists settle metaphysical problems. Justice must be swift and sure, end quote. After just three days of testimony and presentation, the trial of Martha Needle ended with the all-male jury taking just under 40 minutes to find her guilty of murder. There was no recommendation for mercy given by the jury either. Martha Needle was sentenced to death by hanging, as was, I guess, custom back then. For someone who was claiming to be emotionally unstable, Martha Needle took the news of her death sentence very, very well. No fits of faints here. She didn't lose her composure and was evil, even able to walk out of the courtroom unassisted after hearing it. After the verdict and sentencing, the Victorian branch of the Howell Association for the Prevention of Crime sent a letter to the governor, the Earl of Hopeton, pleading for him to commute Martha's sentence from death to life in prison on the grounds of she was insane, on the grounds of insanity. The Earl of Hopeton didn't really know what to do with this, so he sent the letter and the request on to the Attorney General, who of course rejected the insanity plea just as the judge did, and Martha's guilty conviction stood, and she was still going to be hanged. Martha Needle was sent to Melbourne Prison, where she spent all of her time there being a model prisoner. She was described as polite, friendly, helpful. She carried around her Bible and her prayer book and prayed constantly. Everybody liked her. On October 22nd, 1894, Martha Needle was hanged. She was a pretty wealthy woman when she had been arrested and she had a lot to leave in her will and she left everything to Otto. She, I guess, genuinely did love him. And in fact, he did stand by her side right up to the very end, never for a minute believing in her guilt. And if he did, he never showed it. Remember, he testified in her defense. So before we end, guys, I have one more little detail, one more little shock on this case um, that I thought was pretty interesting. So Martha Needle had a sister named Eileen and Eileen had a son named Alexander. So Alexander was Martha Needle's nephew. 30 years after she was executed for her crimes, so was Alexander as he had killed his wife and three of their seven children. Is it genetic? So that's it for today, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Thank you so much for constantly supporting me and showing me all this love. Please give this video a big thumbs up. Give it a like if you enjoyed it and share it as well if you should feel so inclined. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit me up in email, my Instagram if you want to see uh, my personal photos. I really don't respond too much on there. I'm still getting my Twitter up. I'm still working and I'm almost done with downloading the videos of Hot Mess Recovery to get that up hopefully by the end of January. Guys, check out my podcast, Strange Things with Steve Stockton and Gemma Jade that airs every Friday. I'll leave a link in the description box to the last episode, Strange Ouija Board Stories. And tomorrow, Strange Christmas Creatures is going to air. Um, we don't have any subscribers over there. So guys, please go check it out. We, I think this is our fourth episode and 
we can really use the support. I can really use the support. So the link will be in the description box. Also, my Patreon, I know it's the holidays. I know it's COVID-19, but if you guys can help and donate in any way to the channel so I can start researching more, um, having more time, having better equipment, it would really, really help me. It would mean the world to me if you're able to donate anything. There's only one tier, but I am working on content, even though I only have two patrons you guys are um, supporting me. And so I'm going to put up some special content in the next coming week for Patreons. So the link to my Patreon will be in the description box. The money goes directly to me. I receive it immediately. Also, if you do not want to become a Patreon or a patron, please click the link in the description box to donate to my PayPal. If you should feel so inclined, that also comes directly to me. Sorry if I'm a little stuttery. I feel really uncomfortable talking about this, but this channel is not monetized. The podcast is not monetized. I'm doing all of this full time in my free time while taking care of a toddler. So if there's anything you can support me with financially, great. Click the Patreon, click the PayPal. If not, thank you so much for supporting me just by watching my videos, liking them, being a subscriber, sharing them, and hanging out with me. So guys, have your best day, have your best night, be kind to each other. It doesn't cost anything and it can really gain you so much. Again, um, thanks for stopping by and I'll see you in the comments. Bye. Bye.